Hello and welcome to Hard Talk. I'm Sean Lay. Sense the party's thought, obey the party's words, follow the party's lead. The words printed in red on a building at an internment camp in China. There are a lot of those in Xinjiang, one of the country's wealthiest provinces, and also one of its most restive. It's home to the Uyghur Muslim ethnic group, and there are reports of over a million people currently in detention. The government says the camps are needed to re-educate the people, hence that sign. They say they're fighting Islamic terror in the region. Nuri Takel is chairman of the Uyghur Human Rights Project. So is he being duped, or is China duping the rest of the world? Nuri Tukel, welcome to Hard Talk. Can you describe for me the experience of being a Uyghur in Xinjiang province these days? Imagine that um, you go to church on Sunday and the government stops you and makes you to go through iris and body scans. And imagine that you get up on one morning and the government wants you to marry off your daughter to someone part of the oppressed ethnic group. Imagine that you are, um, don't have anyone to confide with, even in your private life. And imagine that you were forced to denounce your religion and, and denounce uh, and walk away from your centuries-old uh, tradition, uh, such as the Uyghurs. So what is happening in, in the Uyghur, uh, Uyghurs' homeland, East Turkestan, is uh, cultural revolution and steroids. The Chinese government has been so brutal, uh, particularly in la last 16, 18 months, locked up uh, more than 10% of the population, according to various reports. Uh, we're talking about a population of 10 million people, so you're talking about 10%, uh, effectively a million Uyghurs in detention. The numbers could be higher. Uh, a human rights organization uh, published a report recently. It estimates 3.3 million people being affected. The Chinese government has been carrying out this internment camp or so-called re-education programs uh, in three ways. One, they lock you up and impose heavy sentence anywhere from 10 to 15 years. You ba basically go and uh, serve jail time. The second type of uh, uh, group, sec second uh, group of people who has been subject to this is uh, daily re-education. You go there and then come home at night. And then the third one is a hard. Uh, uh, the ones who kept in the uh, high walls and bar barbed wires. They go through a daily routine, uh, denouncing, uh, renouncing their religious background, phrasing she, studying she, soth. This President Xi Jinping. Yes, exactly. And also uh, watching uh, so-called anti-separatist uh, anti videos, singing Chinese uh, communist songs, uh, stuff like that. They you haven't lived in China for more than 20 years now. I mean, how can you know this apart from through second and third hand accounts? No, actually, I, I follow the news and I talk to people who have been, uh, uh, who, was able, who were able to leave the country in the recent years. Um, I've done some asylum work and I've uh, exposed to some uh, new generation of Uyghurs in the United States. So and you're I've... saying this is what people have told you as they yeah. come out? I mean, I have a description from a, a radio journalist called Chera Hoxha, uh, and she uh, talked about what it means for her personally. She works for the US-funded Radio Free Asia, and she says more than two dozen of my relatives in China are missing. My brother was detained at the end of September. In February, my parents, both elderly and suffering from life-threatening ailments, went missing. I learned in February my aunts, cousins, children, more than 20 people have been swept up by the authorities. I found out later they'd all been detained on the same day. I, I happen to know this family from my childhood years. Uh, this particular reporter's father is my, my father's friend. Uh, I've seen him in real time as a child. He's a terrific guy, uh, trained as an anthropologist, uh, very well revered, respected and revered individual. What the Chinese government has problem with people like him is the fact that they are promoting, uh, in a way, through intellectual uh, methods to uh, make the Uyghurs pr feel pride, proud of their uh, cultural, ethnic heritage. You were born yourself in a labor camp. 
uh, the beginning of the 1970s, I think. You were in a labour camp because your parents were persecuted during the Cultural Revolution. Do you think Xinjiang is going through something similar again? The, um, it's, it's inconceivable that we talk about this in 2018. Uh, history is taking a very strange turn and repeating itself. I was born at the height of uh, Cultural Revol Revolution in a similar re-education camp. Uh, my mother was taken in when she was six months old, uh, six, six months old, uh, pregnant with me, and we were released uh, about four or five months afterwards. Uh, uh, she gave birth to me. So during that period, uh, we both suffered a uh, very uh, difficult uh, time, uh, health issues, uh, daily humiliation, uh, physical, verbal abuses, and uh, it, it's just mind-boggling, and it's hard to believe that we're talking about similar situation taking place 47 years later. What does this mean for you personally now? I said you haven't lived in China, I think, since 1995, but obviously you still have family there. Um, like my fellow Uyghurs, um, I have been going through um, a very difficult time, um, uh, simply because um, the Chinese government effectively exported its oppression uh, to Uyghurs who are living as a free person like myself, as a citizen of a civilized world. You try to have a normal life, but you cannot, thinking that your family members are suffering and you are physically, financially capable, and yet you cannot be at their bedside when they're suffering health issues. Were some of the Uyghurs actually missing uh, funerals? Uh, in fact, in my, my family situation, my mother has seven uh, grandchildren. She was able to hold only two of them. You can't really talk about your parents' situation. That must be, even in itself be quite difficult for you. It is difficult um, in two ways. One, um, the Chinese government has created a fear uh, of uh, a reprisal in uh, Uyghur citizens of Western world's mind. Um, because of that fear, um, not many Uyghurs will be willing to come and tell their family stories. Because you never know, uh, oppressed people and very repressive government, and you never know what they will do to your family. And um, doing, stuff, uh, doing the things like I have been doing is a conscionable thing to do. Um, I, I'm, I, I'm feeling proud to be a voice for voiceless, uh, millions of voiceless Uyghur people back home. You told us earlier in the interview that what, as one of the examples of, of what you see as the kind of uh, repression of Uyghurs in China that they are being told uh, to study the thought of Xi Jinping. And one Uyghur, uh, who formerly made detention camp, was quoted by the Wall Street Journal this month, August 2018, saying, they said we should give thanks not to Allah but to Xi Jinping. Well, that's not unusual in China, is it? All around China, people are told to study the thoughts of the president. The president is almost deified in China now. That's not special to the Uyghurs. How does that count as oppression? Uh, let's talk about what the Chinese government's motive intentions are. Uh, Can you answer that question? Yeah, uh, the Chinese government is, is using uh, East Turkestan or Uyghur lives as a laboratory for a total surveillance, uh, brutal repression. And if we're not careful, if, you, if I'm, I'm saying this to the Chinese citizens uh, on the other parts of China, this will be exported. The methods, similar methods have been used, applied, implemented in Tibet, and then the new sheriff in town who is running the uh, show in uh, East Turkestan for the Chinese government used to be the head of a, a communist party And, and that's Tibet. your explanation for why in the last 18 months things have become that much harder because he's brought the techniques he uh, developed in Tibet to his new job in your province. That's exactly right. The Chinese government has pilot programs. They apply, they implement in one region. If it works, they implement, uh, they start enforcing it in other. So Tibet and East Turkestan has been a kind of a, a, a playground for their pilot program. She used this phrase, East Turkestan, uh, uh, and I'm talking about Xijiang. So there's a basic difference here, isn't there? For you and some other Uyghurs, you don't really accept that this Chinese province is part of China, you want it to be part of a separate uh, Uyghur state in East Turkestan. East Turkestan is this historic name for the Uyghurs, it has a, a, a tremendous significance. 
the Uyghurs had have, have had uh, two republics, one thing, uh, one, the first one in 1933 and the second one is 1944. With yeah, that they didn't last with very long, exact, did they? About uh, a year for the first one and at most five years for the second one during exactly, the Civil War. Exactly, uh, because of... It's a very uh, short period in a very long history. But because of that uh, proud history that Uyghurs cherish, uh, they like to call their homeland uh, as East Turkestan. But Xinjiang... Uh, can be translated as New Dominion, New Frontier. That is the name imposed by Communist Party or Communist China. So See, the Uyghurs resent that name. See, that's what uh, the Chinese say. They say look, that a lot of this is uh, actually about problems that are being caused on the ground by Uyghurs. Uh, and they give examples of this. They say, for example, there's nothing arbitrary about the detention camps. There are vocational training centres. There isn't such a thing as re-education centres in Xinjiang. Uh, and they say that, for example, the, the relocation of people, 461,000 people at the beginning of the first three months of this year, to quote the Global Times newspaper this month, is to improve social stability and alleviate poverty. Those are good ambitions. That's a bogus claim as well, at best. Here's why. The Chinese government has... Um, unstated goals. Uh, one is being Xi Jinping is the one man show in the country. They wanted to be, he does not want to be blamed for anything that politically uh, uh, results in political disaster because they have a domino effect in his uh, uh, leadership role. And then two, uh, there's some racism in this. The Chinese government believe uh, that Uyghur's ethno-national identity it will present a political threat in the future. So they wanted to uh, take a preventive measure to forcibly assimilate the Uyghurs. That's and then not the what the Chinese say. I'm sorry to interrupt. China's foreign ministry says everyone can see that people of all <coughs> ethnicities in Xinjiang live and work in peace and contentment. That's what they have to say because they need to w find a way to justify the brutality they have been implemented. So th what is it, how, how would they be able to justify locking up more than 10% of the population? And we know the re-education of what? Re-education of someone transferring from um, one ethnic group to an uh, atheist or non-religious believer? What are they trying to do? This, this term in of itself is a problematic. It's a propaganda. The Chinese government can say anything, but making uh, that kind of statement three times does not make it true. Um, let's, let's talk about uh, another reason that the Chinese give for the actions they've taken. And they warn about those being deceived by religious extremism. They're saying they'll be assisted by resettlement and re-education. That's how the Chinese delegation to the UN in Geneva puts it. And when you set against this incredible figure... Uh, and no one would argue with this, I think, incredible figure of 21% of all arrests in China being in Xinjiang, which is only, what, 1.5% uh, of the whole Chinese population. But they then point to the violence that's been, and the violence there has been considerable, hasn't it? Give, I'll give you some examples, and then I'll, 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 I'll be interested to hear your response. A bomb and knife attack at Unruchi South Railway Station. Two dead, 79 injured. 31 killed, 90 more injured when two cars crashed through an Arumchi market and Arumchi market and explosives were tossed into the crowd. A knife wielding gang attacks a police station and government offices in Yarkat. 96 dead. 50 die in blasts in Luntai County outside police stations, a market and a shop. All those attacks in one year alone, there is violence in, uh, in that province and it's not coming from the government. That does not give the Chinese government justification to lock up uh, poets, university professors, scholars, musicians, um, uh, athletes uh, in the concentration camps. The British government did it in Northern Ireland in the 1970s, had a policy of internment where it said, look, we're worried some of these people might turn to violence, therefore we, we will put them in prison. We should learn the lesson from the history. United States have done it as well. That does not make it a right thing to do. Um, the Chinese government has done uh, three things very skillfully, um, uh, Sean. One, um, they have been effectively played into uh, people's emotion in the West. UK, European countries, United States well, have I, been... I do, I do want to deal with that because it's an important point, yeah. but let me just deal with the emotions of people who live in that region, okay. who fear that kind of violence. When the government says to them, we must hold on to our belief that keeping turmoil away from Xinjiang is the greatest human right, you wouldn't dispute that, would you? You're a human rights advocate yourself. Keeping people safe, letting them feel that they aren't in danger of being killed when they walk out of their front door is actually... a fundamental responsibility of that is a, that is that is a that is um, a theory that's what they say that they are doing you don't but believe i don't believe it because they're trying to create a total surveillance state uh, 
They will, they are trying to forcibly assimilate the Uyghurs. If anyone stand in the way, will be end up in concentration camps. Last uh, April, they uh, implemented this draconian uh, regulation called de-extremification measure that sanctions some of the most acceptable and normal behaviors in a civilized society, like growing beard, uh, adhering to um, halal diet, uh, and, 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 and naming children with uh, religious uh, names. That sort of stuff has been, so the Chinese government has been paving the way for today's let, a nightmare for some time. Let me repeat uh, the point, and that is that uh, the Chinese government believes that there are groups who claim to be Uyghur uh, campaigners who are prepared to use violence. There was an attack in Beijing in October 2013 in which half a dozen people were killed, several dozen were injured. It was claimed by the Turkistan Islamic Party. That was formed in 2006 by Uyghurs who had fled China for Afghanistan and Pakistan. And it said it was responsible for a number of attacks. Now, Stratfor, which is a US analytical company you may be aware of, said claims of responsibility appear exaggerated, but the threat the Turkestan Islamic Party poses cannot be ignored. Uh, the Chinese government <coughs> can say um, the same thing uh, 15 times. That's not the Chinese government. The That's Chinese, American analysts. The sor source of this information is the Chinese government because TIP or ETIM, all of it, was uh, enlisted in a terrorist uh, designation list at the request of the Chinese government. To well, the US State Department said in 2006 that the East Turkestan Islamic Movement, which uses the name TIP, as you know, it, these, these are groups are all quite overlapping, is the most militant of the ethnic Uyghur separatist groups. Sean, that's 12 years ago. We live so they reformed? They, they? Yeah, we li no, they didn't reform. The Chinese showing a true color. This has been, the Chinese government uh, have one of the countries that effectively utilized um, the 9-11 to their benefit as the Chinese government. Perhaps the most effectively utilized government is the Chinese government. Yeah, but uh, you, to you told me I was out today. I'll tell you you're out today. 15 years later, the British government listed both organizations, or if it is one organization with two names, as a terrorist group, Islamic terrorist and separatist organization, it said, this is July 2016, quoted by Reuters, trying to create an independent caliphate. That, 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 that kind of rhetoric has been floating around without a hard evidence. I think this is all... So you think the West is being duped? Uh, duped, yes. It's a political decision. When you talk to Western government officials, this is one of the problems that I'd like to uh, highlight in here. Because of the Chinese government's strategic approach and, and very skillful way of uh, creating that hysteria, some of the good people in the national security intelligence communities in UK, in the United States, elsewhere, have tapped into the Chinese uh, rhetoric, believing that China and the West are fighting a similar type of uh, fight against terrorism, which, is a, which, is, which defeats the uh, logic. Trouble is, I mean, whether or not you accept that some Uyghurs in exile are keeping some very unpleasant company, Philip Potter in Strategic Studies Quarterly said that uh, they're forging strategic alliances with and even leading jihadist factions affiliated with Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. And there's a report only this week, mid-August 2018, that the China's special envoy to Syria is worried about Uyghurs uh, having gone to fight there. Even if you say all of that is black propaganda, for people living in China, uh, they will believe, won't they, what the Global Times, the, the state-owned tabloid says, that the crackdown in your province, your home province, has salvaged it and it has avoided the fate of becoming China's Syria or China's Libya. You know, you know Sean, as you know, <clears throat> they're, they're sizable Western individuals joined the forces in Syria. But none of the Western governments will have been setting up internment camps for anyone who are, might be having a tendencies to take up arms against the Western interests. Do you know what China means by an abnormally long beard? Um, that is, um, I've seen the religious figures in Christian and Jewish communities. Um, Especially in New York, um, when you walk around some parts of New York, you'll see a Jewish individual with a long beard. That sort of beard uh, is considered extreme sign of extremism in China. So these are the measure among the measures that have yeah. been, uh, particularly in the last year and a half or so, that been includes st the uh, growing beard for yep. style.
So, uh, but but it's aimed, in your view, at yeah. a visible identification of somebody as a weak. Because that will make you look different than the Chinese. Uh, another reference has been to dissuade people who cover their bodies and veil their faces from entering railway stations and airports. That's happening too, is it? As far as you're aware. You know, the Uyghurs are easy to identify. Because uh, most Uyghurs look, Euro look Eurasian. Uh, they have a high bridge nose, and fair skin, uh, and easily can be identified by anyone in China. That actually makes them more vulnerable in society for racial discrimination. The uh, last October, President Xi told the party conference that uh, it must uphold the principle that religions in China must be Chinese in orientation and provide active guidance to religions so that they can adapt themselves to the socialist society. The truth is, it's not just Muslims who experience that, is it? It's Christians in China as well. It's other religious denominations. They That's are not singling out the Uyghurs. That is the exact point that I want your audience to know. There is a clear and present danger that this brutal policy will be expended to it. They're testing the ground. The Uyghur, Uyghur's homeland and their lives have been a testing ground, a laboratory for future policies. Oppressive policies will not only stay in China, will be exported to China-related countries President around the world. President Trump sees a President Xi Jinping as an ally. He's gone so far as to call him a friend, uh, Angela, Mer Angela Merkel. The German Chancellor has been to China, I think, 11 times in 12 years. On no occasion has she raised the, the plight of the Uyghur. Uh, do you have any hope at all that the Trump administration is going to act on your concerns? Trump administration have already acted. Um, uh, Vice President Mike Pence, uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, raised the Uyghur, um, deteriorating Uyghur human rights situation in a public speech during the ministerial uh, in Washington. And uh, the UN ambassador, uh, Kelly Curry, have been regularly raising it. She, in fact, testified a couple of weeks ago at the United States Congress, uh, highlighting uh, the worsening human yeah, rights situation. We know that the president often doesn't do the same thing as his colleagues. He told Lou Dobbs on Fox News in October last year, some people might call Xi Jinping the king of China. He's a powerful man. I happen to think he's a very good person. We have to separate what uh, President Trump views Chinese leader of China. Uh, we have to look at the United States is, 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 has a, 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 a um, plenty of experts in the United States government who work on China. So the, I, I, I don't know what uh, President Trump's mind is heading to when it comes to China, Xi Jinping, but I do believe that there, he has a good team of uh, uh, experts in the government who understands the issue. One final question. Murat Uyghur, who now lives in Finland, says of the internment camps, they're like a black hole. People go in, they don't come out. I'm afraid of the worst now. What are you afraid of? I am afraid of mass murder because we don't know uh, other than a few individuals managed to leave the camps, uh, people are not leaving. Uh, where are those uh, million people gone? What are they uh, being charged of? It's basically a no rights zone as the UN official perfectly pointed out. You have no access to a lawyer, you, are, you have no access to judicial process, and there is no access to uh, family members. There is no access to a proper medical care. Uh, that's why we've seen people uh, leaving as a dead person from the camps. So um, I am worried. And also there's an important part of my worry is that the Chinese government has been building a crematoria. A crematoria. 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 And they're hiring people to work on those uh, facilities. Why are, why are they building all of a sudden uh, in such places? In a uh, traditionally American academics, if I may finish, um, have been very careful in their criticism of the Chinese government. Recently, one of the well-respected uh, American academics said publicly twice that he worried that there will be a mass murder in those and you, camps. And you worry too. Nuri Takel of the Uyghur Human Rights Project in Washington, D.C. Thank you for being with us on the Thank Talk. you very much. Thank you.